This is EE698I, Mixed Signal IC Design. And this is lecture number 16. In the last couple of classes, we have been discussing about a switch capacitor amplifier. And in the last class, we saw what happens when we use an OTA instead of an op-amp in this switch cap amplifier. So let me draw the circuit once again. So this is the switches during the phase 51. And this will be clocked by an early clock 51E. So I'll have one more switch here. This is the OTA and the feedback cap. And the feedback cap is also reset to ground or the common mode voltage during the phase 51. So one important different difference we noticed was that with the OTA, even if we do not consider the on resistance of these switches, the output does not settle instantly, but instead it rises exponentially with a time constant, right? So if this is the phase phi two, and if this is the beginning of phi two, we saw that the virtual ground voltage Vx, it jumps to minus V, right? And here I'm assuming the common mode voltage is all zero volts. Okay. And then it exponentially rises and settles to zero. Similarly, if you take a look at the output voltage, V naught, that will also jump to minus V in and exponentially rise and settle to the final value of CF by, sorry, C by CF times V in. And we saw that the time constant tau was C by GM, right? And if we have the on resistance, this is going to be C into R on plus one by GM. That R on is the on resistance of these two switches together. And we saw that in practice, we usually make this on resistance to be much, much smaller than one by GM because it's easier to design switches with low on resistance. So that time constant in is approximately this level. Okay. And how did we find the time constant? Well, we took this equivalent circuit during the phase phi two. Right. And we found what is the equivalent impedance looking here. And this turned out to be a resistance of value one by GM. Okay. And so the overall circuit is a first order RC circuit like this. Okay. And to find the time constant, we can also find the equivalent impedance looking from the output side as well. And this will work because the overall circuit is the first order circuit. And if you had derived the transfer function, you could have noticed that. And since this is a first order circuit, it will have only one time constant. And so you can find it by looking at the equivalent impedance, either from this side or from this side. So for, as an exercise, let's take a look at the uh, impedance looking from the output. So how do you find it? I'll say I apply a test voltage. We test at the output. And this is the current IT. And if this voltage is VT, what will be this voltage VX? That will simply be the capacitive division. So VX will be VT times CF by CF plus C, right? So let me just erase this part. And what is this current? If I call it I naught, I naught will simply be minus GM times VX. This is simply minus GM times CF by CF plus C. Okay, so the current IT, that the current in this direction, is simply minus I naught, that is this current, plus this current. And this current in turn is equal to the current through the capacitor C. Right? So this is simply minus I naught, plus the current through the capacitor C is Vx times SC. 
so sorry this should be vt right so the overall current is gm times cf by cf plus c times vt plus sc times vx is this guy so this is going to be cf by cf plus c times vt right so from this we can clearly see that the output looking into the output we have a resistor and a capacitor in parallel right because uh, this is the it by vt it's the output admittance right so looking into the output side we have an equivalent circuit like this we have a resistor and a capacitor in parallel and what is the resistance value it is 1 by gm cf by cf plus c and the capacitance value is c into cf by c plus cf right so what is the time constant that is going to be the product of this resistor and the capacitor and the product is simply c by gm right this guy will get cancelled with this guy so we'll be left with c by gm right and that's what we saw when we looked at the equivalent impedance this side also okay and uh, why does uh, this output impedance make sense well if you look at it from the output if you apply a voltage v test a fraction of the voltage that is cf by cf plus c appears here right so the current that is pulled out in this direction is this guy, right and this corresponds to a resistor of 1 by gm times cf by cf plus c okay and on top of it we also have uh, these two capacitors in series right so at high frequencies only this guy, this portion will dominate. So we have the series combination of C and CF, right? And uh, we also saw in the last class that because the virtual ground voltage Vx jumps to minus V in, the instantaneous current that is required from the OTA is GM times V, in, right? Plus or minus GM V, in, depending on the polarity of the input, and if the bias current of the OTA is less than this fellow, which is often always the case because you don't want to burn a lot of power in the OTA. So what will happen in that case? We saw that the output will slew. That is the entire bias current of the OTA will be diverted to charge these capacitors. And the time for which the output slews will depend on the input, right? Because slowing will happen till the differential voltage is such that the current needed from the OTA, that is GM times the differential voltage, becomes less than the bias current, right? And since the uh, since the slowing time depends on the input voltage itself, this will in turn result in nonlinearity. And to make sure that the slowing doesn't introduce a lot of nonlinearity, we need to make sure that slowing time is a small fraction of the available time for settling and this can be done by increasing the bias current right so there is one more important difference when we use an op amp versus when you use an ota which is the following so when you use an op amp during the phase phi 2 we have the equivalent circuit like this Right. So, since this is an op amp, that is a voltage control voltage source, even if you connect load capacitors here or even load resistors, this output voltage will not change ideally, right? Because this is an ideal voltage source or voltage control voltage source. So, this voltage V0 is going to be fixed, right? But on the other hand, when we use an OTA, We'll have the circuit like this. And with the OTA, only this current is fixed, right? So the output voltage here will depend on the load capacitor we have here. Okay. 
And remember that this load capacitor CL could be the intrinsic parasitic capacitance of the OTA or even the sampling capacitor from the next stage. Okay. So here the output of this OTA can be sampled by second stage, right? And this could denote the sampling capacitance of the second stage, right? And uh, during which phase this switch should be active? Well, this should be active during the phase phi 2 because only during the phase phi 2 the OTA is settling and providing the correct output and during the phase phi 1 the outputs are reset, right? So during the phase phi 2 we'll have this load capacitor connected. So since the output voltage here will depend on the load capacitor, the output waveforms we had without the CL right, will not be the same the moment we have CL. So let's qualitatively understand quickly what will happen to the output waveforms when we have this load capacitor. So again, let's uh, look at the circuit during the phase phi one. So during the phase phi one, it's the same. So we have the input voltage connected to the sampling capacitor. I'll just show it like this. And during the, and sorry, the OTA and the feedback capacitor and the load capacitor are all reset. And during the phase phi two, this is the equivalent circuit, right? So let us now see what happens to the voltages Vx and V0 just after phi two. So just after phi two is made high, the OTA cannot respond instantly. So the virtual one voltage will not instantly become zero. Right? So this is something we saw last time itself. So just when phi2 is made high, the OTA is not active. So we can represent the equivalent circuit just after phi2 like this. Okay. And please recollect that when we didn't have the load capacitor CL, this was an open circuit. So there cannot be no charge transfer. There cannot be any charge transfer between these two capacitors. So the voltage is stored across these two capacitors will remain same. So which meant that this voltage Vx went to minus V in. Similarly, this voltage V0 also went to minus V in, right? But now please notice that we have uh, the load capacitor here that is providing a path for the currents to flow, right? So which means there will be an instantaneous charge transfer between these three capacitors, okay? So what will be the voltages Vx and V0? Well, we can simply find it using charge conservation. So just after phi 2, the total charge stored at this node, what is it? It is going to be Vx times C plus Vx times these, these two series capacitors, which is CF into CL by CF plus CL, this should be equal to the charge stored at this node, that is these two plates in the earlier phase, right? Which was here, right? So during the phase phi one, the charge stored in this plate is minus CV in, and in this plate it's zero, right? So this is going to be minus C times V in. So what is Vx then? It's going to be minus V in into C by C plus Cf into Cl by Cf plus Cl, right? And here, if we put Cl to be zero, this Vx is simply equal to minus V, right? And that's what we saw in the last class also. So what is going to be my uh, output voltage V0 then? Well, V0, this is simply the capacitive division between CF and CL. So V0 is going to be Vx times CF by CF plus CL. So this is going to be minus V in into C into CF by CF 
plus C L divided by C plus C F C L by C F plus C L. So I'll bring this down to the denominator. So we'll have what? C C F by C into C F plus C L. So that is C C F plus C times C L plus C F times C L. So I can simplify it to be like this. So I'll take C L from these two guys. So and then I'll have C C F plus C L into C plus C F and C times C F here. I'll divide this on both numerator and denominator. So I'll have C C F plus C C F by C plus C F plus C L and I'll have this as well. Right, so this is essentially minus B in into the series combination of these two capacitors. So I'll just call it C equivalent divided by C L plus C equivalent. Okay. So this will be the instantaneous voltages just after phi 2 is made high. Right. And from this, we can clearly see that when C L is 0, this is going to be minus V L. And that's what we expected from the earlier class analysis as well. So how will the voltage, uh, how will the waveforms look like? So this is during phi two. So let's say this is the phase phi two. So Vx is going to jump to a value that is minus Cv in by C plus cf cl by cf plus cl similarly the output voltage v naught that is falling down to a voltage minus v in into c into i'll just call c equivalent by cl plus c equivalent right so which means how will the current i naught that is this current look like that will instantaneously jump to gm times this voltage right so it will be some value here and once the current starts to flow the voltages vx and v naught will start to increase right and once the voltage vx increases the current i naught decrease decreases so we'll have this kind of an exponential behavior right so i naught will fall to zero and V naught will rise to C by C F times V, right? So this will be zero, this will be zero, right? So what will be the time constant? We can again find it by uh, looking at the equivalent impedance, either at the input side or at the output side. Okay, again, this will be a first order circuit. If you exactly find the transfer function, you'll know it. So you can find the uh, time constant by looking at the equivalent impedance on either side. So this is the circuit we have. Right, this is C, C, F and C, L. And we just saw what is the equivalent impedance looking at the output side, which is this fellow, right? So let me just copy paste this. So just save some space here. Okay, so this is the equivalent impedance looking into the output. And again, uh, along with this, we have the capacitor CL as well. So what is the equivalent time constant now that is the resistance times the capacitance which is simply 1 by gm times cf by cf plus c times the total capacitance which is cl plus c times cf by c plus cf right you can also find this by uh, looking at the impedance in this direction and 
if you find the time constant it will be this guy only okay so let's also do that quickly for uh sake of completeness so let me draw the circuit once again here right so i'm going to find the impedance looking in this direction so i'll not show the c i have cf here and c so let us say this voltage is vx and this current is ix okay so what is the current that is pushed out of the ota that's going to be minus uh, gm times vx right and this current has two parts either it can go this is in this direction right or in this direction and the fraction of the current that is going uh, here and here will depend on the capacitances right so the current that is going in this direction is going to be gm vx into cf by cf plus cl right so this current is this guy and the same current is going to come here and flow in this direction right so which means the current ix is going to be the negative of this current right so the equivalent resistance that is vx by ix is going to be 1 by gm into cf by cf plus cf right and similarly at high frequencies we have uh, this branch to be dominant and this essentially comprises of these two capacitors cf and cl in series right so the total uh, capacitance looking into this side it's going to be the series combination of these two capacitors right so the equivalent impedance it's going to be this we already have a c here right and along with that, we have the resistor here, which is 1 by gm into cf by cf plus cl. And then we have the capacitors here, which is this cell. Right? So the time constant, what will it be? So it's going to be the product of this resistor and the total capacitance which is simply 1 by gm cf by cf plus cl into c plus cf cl by cf plus cl and you can simplify this to be 1 by gm cf into c into cf plus cl plus cf into cl okay. and this can in turn be simplified to be 1 by gm into cf into c times c plus cf plus cc okay. and you can take c plus cf outside and you will get this guy. okay so the bottom line is that the moment you have cl the time constant is going to change to this guy okay and you can also find it uh, in a more rigorous way using kcl wherein you represent the initial condition or the voltage stored in this capacitor c during the phase phi one as an equivalent voltage source with value minus v in bias in the Laplace domain. So we have C here, OTA here, the feedback capacitor and the load capacitor. Right? So you can again solve this uh, using KCL. So you can apply KCL at these two nodes and find the output transfer function and take the inverse Laplace transform. And you will find that the output voltage follows this profile, right? And how does it look like? The final value is C by CF times V in, right? So this is a first order RC, uh, first order circuit. So the output will follow this relation. The final voltage times one minus C power minus T by tau plus the initial voltage, which is this fellow. So that's minus 
mean into this c equivalent uh, one what is c equivalent c equivalent is the series combination of c and cs so we we'll have c cf by c plus cf divided by cl plus c cf by c plus cs into e power minus t by tau and tau is in turn equal to 1 by uh, g into cf by c plus cf into cl plus c cf by c plus cf right and the easier way to uh, look at this is that looking from the output side we have uh, two uh, we have both a resistor and a capacitor and the resistive component comes due to gm right and that is because a fraction of this voltage gets fed back here and what is that fraction cf by cf plus c okay times the gm this is the current that is uh, flowing in this direction so the equivalent resistance is gm times cf by cf plus c right and similarly the total capacitance here at this node this this load capacitor cl in parallel with these two capacitors in series right and that's the key and if you look at this factor cf by c plus cf that is essentially the fa uh, fraction of this voltage here that is getting fed back right so this is this can be thought of as the feedback factor for the circuit right so we can say that the time constant is 1 by beta gm times the total capacitance which we'll call cl total okay so now uh, let's look at this circuit again so this is the circuit we have we also have the load capacitor cl in the phase vector right when we just had the sampling uh, circuit like this where we just sampled the input during some clock phase 5 we saw that the noise that was sampled across the capacitor had a variance of kt by c right but now we have this complicated looking circuit which is actually quite simple if you understand it right so we have lot more switches and also this vot here so let us now see what will be the total integrated noise or the total noise variance at the output okay so for that we need to consider the noise contributed by all of these switches right as well as the ota okay and the ota has an equivalent voltage noise power spectral density s vn of s to be 4 kt times gamma times gm into sorry gamma by gm into a factor n0 which i'll call the excess noise factor okay and this n0 might be because of the extra biasing transistors you have in the ota which do not contribute to the transconductance but still they will contribute to noise right so the ideal value of n0 will be 1 but of course in practice you will have it to be greater than 1 and this gamma is roughly 2 thirds for uh, transistors in saturation okay so this is going to be the equivalent uh, voltage noise power spectral density for the ota and as usual this is a white noise power spectral density so now let us try to compute the total noise in the circuit for that let's start with the switches that is that are active during the phase 51 so first let's consider the circuit during 51 so what do we have in 51 we have uh, these switches here that is these switches oops these guys right and again for computing noise i'll uh, say that input is zero so we'll have some r on one r right this is the sampling capacitor and 
both these capacitors are reset sorry and this capacitor is reset here right so i'll have cs getting reset like this okay and again these two on resistance they can be combined to a single resistance say some r and then you have the c so now we know what is the noise variance stored across the capacitor and that's going to be kt by c right so let's say that is some vn1 okay and the mean squared value is kt by c similarly for the capacitor cf the mean squared noise voltage say vn2 that's going to be kt by cf right so these are the noise uh, this this is the noise voltage that is sampled across the capacitors during the phase phi one so let us see how these noise these noise voltages get transferred to the feedback capacitor and appear at the output so do equivalent circuit during the phase phi two how will it look like we'll have the circuit to be like this and this is my output voltage so we can find the output voltage using charge conservation right so i'll apply the charge conservation at this node again in steady state we can assume that the virtual ground is at zero so the charge at this node is going to be zero times the capacitor c plus if this capacitor is cf the charge at this plate will be zero minus v naught times cf right and the charge conservation this should be equal to the charges stored on these two plates in the previous phase right and the charge stored in this plate is vn1 times c right i can call plus or minus doesn't matter because we are going to look at the mean squared value right and similarly similarly on this plate we have vn2 times cf stored right so the output voltage we not is simply n1 times c by cf plus vn2 so the mean squared voltage is going to be the mean squared voltage of vn1 that is kt by c times c by cf squared plus the mean squared voltage of vn2 which is kt by cf so this is the noise contribution due to the switches active during the phase 5 right so let's now compute the noise contribution during the phase phi two. So during the phase phi two, the equivalent circuit is this. So I will show the combined on resistance of these two switches as a single resistor, some or on, and then I'll have the sampling capacitor here. I'll have the OTA also contributing to noise, right? So I'll say this has a noise voltage source associated with it this all around so let that be vn1 let this be some or i'll say it's some vn3 okay so let this be some vn4 and then we have the feedback capacitor here and then we have one more on resistance connecting the load capacitors here and again we'll assume that we'll have a series voltage noise source say vn5 associated with this r so well, let's say this is some around three and this is some around five okay so what we have to do to find the output power spectral density or the output noise voltage variance v not well ideally we need to solve this circuit and find what is the transfer function v not of this right we need to find the uh, output voltage in terms of each of these three noise sources so let's say this is some h3 of s times vn3 of s so we need to find all these transfer functions vn4 of s plus h5 of s times vn5 of s and once you know this we can find the power spectral density and that's simply mod h3 of f squared times svn3 of s 
plus mod h4 of f square times s v and 4 of f plus mod h5 of f square times s v and 5 of f. And once you find this, we can find the total mean squared voltage of this continuous time noise by integrating this guy. Right? And we saw that the mean squared value of the sample noise will also be same as the mean squared value of the continuous time noise. Right? So the mean squared value of the sample noise will also be equal to this fellow. And we also saw earlier that when we choose the time constant to be much, much smaller than the settling time period Ts by 2, then the sample noise will have a white noise spectral density because if the time constant is much smaller, the contribution from the previous noise voltage samples will decay with them. Right? So, and this is how we'll usually design a circuit. So we can be sure that the sample noise will be white. And to find the mean squared value, we need to integrate this curve. And of course, straight away, we can see that this is going to be a tedious task, right? So instead of doing this entire thing, for simplicity, we will make some logical assumptions. The first assumption we'll make is that, remember that when we computed the time constant of this circuit, it comprised of both the on resistance of the switch, right? And the GM, which still it was some beta times GM, right? So the uh, total time constant is determined by this combination, right? And we also saw that in practice, it's easy to design switches with low on resistance. So usually R on will be much, much smaller than one by GM. Okay. So what we will do is we'll ignore that the effect of this on resistance is smaller and that the noise is mainly contributed by the OT alone. Okay. And to understand why this actually uh, makes sense, let's look at this simple RC circuit. So let me just bifurcate this. So I'll just push it up somewhere. So when we had a simple RC circuit like this, where this is R and this is C, the mean squared value, how did we find out? We found out using S V of F integral, right? And what is the power spectral density? That was simply 4 K T R times the amplitude of the transfer function, which was one by one plus J two by F R C square. Right? And if you recollect uh, this term or this integral turned out to be one by four RC, right? And that is why when we had four KTR times one by four RC, this gave us KT by C. Okay. So now let us say that we have, or let me move to the next page. So now let us say that this single resistor R is split into two resistors, say R1 and R2. And then we have the same C, right? Again, how do you find the noise contribution due to each resistor? Well, let us say due to this resistor R1, I'll have the power spectral density 4KT R1 times the magnitude of the transfer function. That's going to be same, right? That's going to be one by one plus J two pi F times R1 plus R2 times C. This we have to integrate, right? Because remember, when you represent the voltage noises due to R1, we'll have something like this. So the transfer function from this to this is still this guy, right? And this will be what? This will be 4KTR1. When you integrate this, you will get one by four times R1 plus R2 times C. Right? Similarly, due to the resistor R2, the contribution to the noise variance will be 4KTR2 times one plus four times R1 plus R2C, right? So this is going to be KT times R1 by R1 plus R2 times C plus R2 by R1 plus R2 times C, right? So if you add up, this is going to give you KT by C and that's what we expect. But the important thing to note is that if you choose R2 to be much, much smaller than R1, what will happen? This factor itself will give you roughly KT by C. 
right? And this factor will be very negligible. Okay. So if we were to find the total noise contribution, we could actually simply ignore the contribution due to R1. And I can simply compute what is the noise contribution due to this resistor. And that's directly going to be going to give me KT by C approximately. Right. And that's what we are going to use here also. Since we know that 1 by GM will be much larger than these on resistances, we'll ignore their contributions and find only the contribution due to the OTA. Okay. So let me redraw the circuit now. So I'll ignore the on resistances. I have only the noise due to the OTA, which I called VN4 or yeah, it was VN4. So this is CS and this is C. Okay. And the noise power spectral density was 4KT gamma by GM times some N0. Okay. So what we will do is we'll now transform this voltage into an equivalent current at the output, right? And what will be the equivalent current? Well, this voltage here is going to push in a current of GM times Vn4, right? So what I will do is I'll say we don't have this voltage source here. And we can model this additional current right, by having a current source like this. Okay, again, the direction of the current source is immaterial because it's a noise quantity and we are only interested in the mean squared value. And what is the value of the current source? It is going to be GM times VN4. So let's just, let's just call it some uh, IN. Okay. And VN4 in turn had a power spectral density given by this guy. Right. So let us now try to compute the output voltage noise variance here. And please recollect that we just computed some time back. What is the equivalent impedance looking at the output side? And that was simply a resistor, which was one by beta times GM, where beta is the feedback factor that is CF times the total capacitance, sorry, CF by the total capacitance, CF by CF plus C. And the equivalent capacitance is what? The parallel combination of CL and the series combination of this guy. So it's going to be CL plus CF times C by C plus CF. Okay. And on top of it, we now have the noise current source here. Right. So it's just some IN. And let's say the arrow supports. Again, the direction doesn't matter. Right. And this is going to be my output voltage. V0. So what is going to be the output voltage V0? V0 of uh, is, And that's going to be uh, the current IN of S times the equivalent resistance, sorry, equivalent impedance here, right? So if I just call this to be some R0 and C0, it's going to be R0 by one plus S times R not C not, right? So the out power spectral density will be the power spectral density S I N of F times R not by one plus J two pi F R not C not the magnitude square. Okay. And what is the power spectral density of I N? That is going to be the power spectral density of V and 4 times GM squared, right? So that's, that will be 4 KT gamma by GM times GM square into V naught times this, this entire thing again. Okay. So if I compute the voltage noise variance at the output, that will be 0 to infinity S V naught of F dF. And what will that be? That will be this things times the integral of this quantity. So let me write it once again 4kt gamma by gm 
into gn squared times cn naught right into integral of zero to infinity r naught squared by one plus j two pi f r naught c naught the magnitude squared times d f right so i can simplify it to be this into gm times n naught into i'll take r naught squared outside so this will give me this thing again one plus four pi squared f squared or not squared c not squared d and we know that this integral simplifies to one by four or not c not right so this will be simply four kt comma gm a not times r not squared so r not cancels we have four also cancels we have kt into gamma times a not into gm times r not by c not and what is going to be r not r not is one by beta gm right so this is simply kt gamma a not into gm by one by beta gm by c not this will be kt by c not times gamma into a not by beta okay so let me expand this so it's going to be kt by cl plus c cf by c plus cf into gamma into n not by beta beta is cf by c plus c and so the total noise uh sorry so the total voltage variance due to the noise will be this fellow that is due to the ota during the phase phi 2 plus this thing that we computed that is due to the switches during the phase phi 1 okay so let me write it completely plus we have kt by cl plus c cf by c plus cf times gamma into n naught by cf by c plus cf okay so till this point we have uh, considered only a single ended uh, circuit so how will the equivalent differential implementation look like so we'll have the same thing repeated on uh, two halves. So we'll have one and one here. And this will all be VCM, right? Let me draw it more clearly. This is VCM. This will be one E, this is two. And during the phase phi two, we connect it to this differential, fully differential OTA. Okay. I'll have the same thing on the, on the bottom side as well. So this is one, one E, two, one. So this is going to be CF, CF, and C. And then we'll have the load capacitor here, CL, sample during the phase phi 2. Same here as well. Okay. So this will be the fully differential implementation. Right? And uh, the inputs will be here VCM plus some delta V in by 2. Right here it will be VCM minus delta v in by 2 okay and notice that since we have uh, two sets of switches here the total noise for the fully differential case will be 
twice this guy okay and again how we can compute the steady state output voltages here we can again use charge conservation and in this fully differential case uh, these two voltages will be same due to the negative feedback right and what will be the actual voltages to which these two nodes will be set to well that will depend on the input and the output voltages right so uh, if you look at i mean you can simply uh, you could easily understand it if you look at a case where we have a resistive feedback okay so here what will be these two voltages well these two voltages will be equal right but what will be the exact value of them well that will be set by the common mode voltages at the input and the output right because at the input you will feed some input like this right so the common mode voltage at the input is vcm and similarly for the fully differential ota we will have an output common mode feedback circuit that will set the common mode for the output right so the output will have some common mode, say v not cm which in most cases will be equal to the input common mode of vcm also right and in that case this will also be set to vcm and let us say uh, if the common modes at the input and output are not equal well in that case this voltage will be set by the resistive division between these two voltages right we can easily find it right same thing will happen here also these two voltages right will be set by the common mode voltage at the input and the output and if both of them are equal to vcm this will be also be equal to vcm else they will be determined by the capacitive division we have here okay and one last thing so what we saw now that is this uh, circuit is just one variant of a switch capacitor amplifier and you can have multiple variants of this also right and uh, if you recollect it in the circuit that we have discussed so far the output right is available only let's say uh, if this is the clock if i call this to be phi 1 and phi 2 and if i call the instant nts so the input is sampled at this time instant and the output is available here right after a delay of ts by 2 okay and let us say you don't want to have this delay then uh, you can have a different circuit wherein you take the capacitor reset it during one phase say phi 1 and in the phase phi 2 you do both the sampling and the charge transfer simultaneously so we'll have it something like this so during the phase phi 2 you directly have the transfer like this Okay, and this capacitor is of course reset during the phase five right in this case you clearly see that the moment you are sampling the input in the same time you are actually doing the charge transfer to series right and you can analyze it and please take it as an exercise and you will find that the output here will be minus c by cf times v okay so we'll have this uh, negative gain right and in this circuit notice that this set of switches is what is sampling the input right so if there is some signal dependent charge injection that will be due to one of these switches right and of course we can clearly see that this switch is what will contain the signal dependent charge so to prevent this signal dependent charge injection we need to close this switch uh, sorry turn this switch off early Right, so we will clock it by an early phase of phi 2 which is phi 2e okay and in general the switches that are connected to the virtual ground will not contain any signal dependent charge right because the virtual ground is going to be some common mode voltage so the channel charge will have no signal dependent information right so the usual practice is to make sure that all the switches that are connected to the virtual ground are turned off early Right, so even this switch usually turned off early, right? 
and notice that this ideally does not contain any signal dependent charge right both of these switches but still to be on the safe side the usual practice is to turn the switches connected to the virtual ground early so even here uh, these are the switches connected to the virtual ground so you just simply do phi 1e e, phi 2 e like this right and again this switch is already turned off early So let's stop at this point and continue from the next class.